I have a decision to make right now. Do I want to get out of this car and risk everything, or can I just go home and let this blow over? I woke up in the middle of the night. I was jobless, I was broke, and I was borrowing money to feed myself. It wasn't all fireworks and romance, but I was 33 at this point. You know, I was, I was willing to settle for grown-up love. Tonight's theme is tough choices. Sometimes doing the wrong thing just seems right. You tell a little tiny lie and it makes somebody feel better, or omitting a little bit of the story to your boss makes your coworker seem better. But if we can't be honest with ourselves to make the tough choices and tell the truth, how can we be expected to tell the truth to the people who mean the most to us? My name is Bart Thompson. I'm originally from Omaha, Nebraska. I live in Boston, Massachusetts now, and uh, I'm a teacher in Cambridge. So you've been storytelling for a while now. How have you found your own authentic voice? I started telling stories before I realized what was important to me about those stories, and it's through storytelling that I found my own voice. Mm. And that's because I had to figure out why is this important enough to tell somebody else about it? You know, why is it important enough for me to make myself vulnerable to people who I don't know? And I think whenever somebody takes the opportunity to be open like that, it's a risk. And it's exciting, too. Yeah. I understand that you have been sober for several years. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what role your sobriety plays in your storytelling? Before I got in front of a crowd to tell storytelling in this kind of setting, I started telling my story at 12-step meetings. Mm -hmm. And I have to do that as a way to share with other people that um, not only is recovery possible, but that it can be uh, a source of joy. Mm -hmm. It can be a source of reclaiming your life or finding out who you are. One of the greatest joys that I've gotten out of sobriety is that I was about three years sober and I was visiting my mother in Arizona. Mm -hmm. We sat down together and she said when I got sober that she felt like she got her son back. Mm -hmm. And it was like, I was not, uh, you know, I got sober because I just didn't want to drink and I didn't know how I was going to live, you know, and to realize that not only did those relationships come back and blossom again, but it was eye-opening to realize that in some folks' perspectives, those relationships were lost at some point. It was 10 p.m. on a Friday night in Providence, Rhode Island. I was sitting alone in my car. It was cold. I was hungover from a drunk two days ago, and I was desperate. I couldn't tell you exactly how I got there. All I can tell you is that my reason for being there was lost, and now so was I. Almost two years ago to the day before that night, I had met Karen for the first time. She moved next door to me from Boston, which might as well have been another planet. I was in Omaha. And she brought to me the finer things in life, like the New York Times and car talk. <laughs> I introduced her to catfish along the Missouri River and beer league softball. And we shared these things together, and it was a good time pretty quickly. We would go out with our friends, and sometimes we would get into one-piece jumpsuits like Elvis. And sometimes it would lead to a little more mischief than that. What Karen didn't know was behind her back, I was hiding a secret. About five years before we met, I was sent to a 12-step program because my drinking had gotten me in trouble. And from that point on, I was going from one hope to another, trying to string together a life. Different groups of friends, different jobs, different neighborhoods. And when I met Karen, I thought I found hope again. And it was unfair to her. I was looking for someone to save me, and she just wanted a partner. But we had a really good time together. When Karen told me one night that when I drank, sometimes my eyes glazed over, as she compared it to, you know, sometimes the engine's running, but no one's behind the wheel, I knew exactly what she was talking about. After about four or five drinks, I was done for the night. Not finished, but gone. 
One night I was out with my cousins and I drank so much that uh, I fell face first on the ground and I ended up with a Band-Aid on my forehead. Now, my plan was to clean up the next day and go home because Karen's friends were coming to town to visit and I wanted to leave a good impression. But I had misplaced my car keys that night and I spent the whole day trying to find them. And so when I did meet Karen's friends, I hadn't showered, I hadn't cleaned up. That Band-Aid that was on my forehead was now in my hair. She assured them that it was not always like that. But I couldn't resist. The next night, we were all out at a bar, and I started a drunken argument. And it continued. Karen and I argued in her bathroom over something I have no idea, while her friends, just feet away in her studio apartment, heard her say, the only reason she cared is that she loved me. Now, like a good drunk, I paused for a moment and considered the situation, and then went right back into the argument because I wanted to win. A few weeks after that, Karen asked me point blank, why does this happen? And I told her. I was honest. I said, I'm an alcoholic. She got really upset because she knew that if I'm an alcoholic and I'm getting into recovery, that we can't be in a relationship. And I assured her, no, no, no. No plans for recovery, just giving you an explanation. <laughs> but it was too late. We were already in love. It didn't matter at that point. There were just going to be rough times. So when Karen told me that she was preparing to move back east, I invited myself to come along. I found a job in Virginia that I thought that she would be proud of. And so when we moved east together, she came back to Boston and I went down to Virginia. Now, I thought that this would be a new beginning for me. And it wasn't long later, I found people that drank like I drank. And the distance, I thought, was a problem. Karen and I eventually broke up. I thought, if I just move closer, things will work out a little bit better. So I moved to Rhode Island. And I found out very quickly that you can't put a jackass on a plane in Nebraska and get a thoroughbred in Rhode Island. <laughs> I thought I would read more books and eat more salads. But I found people that drank like I did. And again, within a few months, I was alone. Karen invited me up for Thanksgiving dinner, and I thought that this was a chance to rekindle our relationship. I got really drunk at dinner, and I embarrassed her, and I embarrassed her family, and I embarrassed myself. And she never said it directly, but it was clear after that night that I wasn't welcome in her life anymore. She stopped returning calls, and I spent the next six weeks drinking to excess, crying regularly, questioning how did I get here again? So that brings me to this parking lot in Providence at 10 p.m. on a Friday night. I'm alone. I'm hungover from a drunk two days ago, and I'm lost. I have a decision to make right now. Behind me is a church, and in the basement of that church is a 12-step meeting. And my life is on fire. And I've got to choose, do I want to get out of this car and risk everything? Or can I just go home and let this blow over? But I know in the fog of what's going on in my life that this is the only chance I may ever have to make that choice. So I get out of my car and I very slowly walk over to that building and I walk in. I go down the stairs to where the meeting is and I'm welcomed by five guys in leather jackets and their hair slicked back. I thought I'd walked into Goodfellas. <laughs> there honestly aren't five Italian people in all of Nebraska. <laughs> but they did something very important in that they welcomed me, and I hadn't been welcomed anywhere in a long time. And they told me it was going to be okay if I just stuck with them. And I told them a little bit about how I got there, as though it was the first time any of these guys had heard this story of the lost dog scared and alone. They said, it's OK. And for the first time in my life, I didn't try to change my address. I didn't try to change my partner. I didn't try to change my friends. I was able to stand up in that meeting and raise my hand and say, my name is Bart, and I'm an alcoholic.
I'm Jessica Robinson, and I live in Fairfax, Virginia, where I run a video production company and a storytelling organization. And I've heard that some people believe that life is better in the telling. <laughs> Are you a person who believes that? Yes, that's the better said than done tagline. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me a bit more about Better Said Than Done. I founded Better Said Than Done in 2011 uh, because all the storytelling that was happening in our area was happening in D.C. on a weeknight. So I thought it would be nice to have a local storytelling organization. Uh, and the idea of Better Said Than Done is simply that sometimes life is better in the telling. Sometimes the worst things to live through make the best stories. And it seems like, I mean, all over storytelling has been sort of expanding and exploding. Yeah. And that there's a frequency of shows. Is that the case in Virginia as well? Yeah. So the funny thing is when I started Better Said Than Done, there was only one other show in the area. And now on a monthly basis, there's like, there's 12. How much of that do you feel like is a sign of the times? I think that people feel disconnected. Um, due to social media, due to everyone being on their phone all the time, due to people not making personal connections on a day-to-day -day basis the way we used to. And that is what storytelling offers. It is real people sharing real experiences, and you really feel like you are making a connection both with the audience as a storyteller and with the storyteller as an audience member. So mm -hmm. I think it is a sign of the times that we miss that connection, and storytelling offers us that connection. I was 32 years old, single, and felt like I had gone on one date with every guy on the internet. <laughs> I decided to mix things up a little bit, you know? So I went out to a live event, a singles mixer. But when I got there, it was like all the same lame, not even really choices that I had had online. And then I saw it. This one guy who was not Hugh Jackman, but he would do. <laughs> he could still see his toes past his belly, and he wouldn't remember where he was the day Kennedy was shot. <laughs> I locked on my target and made contact. Roy and I had our first date over burgers, the fact that I ordered a cheeseburger seemed like some sort of ploy to him, like I was just playing at not caring about what I was eating on a first date. But I don't play games, I just happen to love a good burger. As the night wrapped up, Roy asked me to guess how old he was, which was awkward, right? I mean, he looked like he was somewhere in his 40s, so I just said, uh, 35? <laughs> he laughed and said, no, really. So I said, 39? We played the guessing game a little longer, but he told me he'd only give me the answer on our next date. There was nothing wrong with our first date. I mean, I wasn't blown away, but I had fun, and he had fun, so we met for the second date. I got to find out how old he was. Not even 30. Oh. We laughed about it and moved on, but he was convinced I had just been playing dumb. Six months later, we were still dating, just dating. He was nice and normal. He made me laugh, made good money. Heck, he was a good catch. And when we hung out with my family, my nieces called him Uncle Roy, and he was great with them. And then my belly started making this ticking sound, and I remembered that I was over 30. I said, we should be exclusive, or we should break up. He said, I like my freedom. I said, you're not dating other people. I'm the only one dating anyone else. He said, I just like to keep my options open. It was infuriating. I was willing to give up seeing other people, admittedly other lame people and not that many of them, <laughs> for him, and, and he didn't seem to care. I did not have time to waste on this guy, so I said, fine, let's break up. 
he didn't want to break up. And I didn't really want to go out and look for another guy, so we stopped seeing other people. There was nothing wrong with our relationship. It was easy. Neither of us demanded much of the other person. We, we never fought. I always had a date on the weekend. It wasn't all fireworks and romance, but I was 33 at this point. You know, I was, I was willing to settle for grown-up love. <laughs> and then it was six months later, and, and my belly was still doing that ticking thing, even if my heart wasn't exactly pounding. I made him laugh, I made my own good money, and I cooked him a lot of great meals. It bothered me that he wasn't pushing for a commitment. He didn't seem to realize what a great catch I was. <laughs> I said, we should move in together. He said, I'm not ready for that. Well, then maybe we should break up. You wouldn't leave me. You love me too much. But I wasn't playing. I said, fine, let's break up. To which he said, no, no, let's move in together. <laughs> what? It was like one of those scenes in Bugs Bunny where Bugs is arguing with Elmer Fudd. Elmer says, get in the pot. Bugs says, no. Elmer says, yes. Bugs says, no. Elmer says, yes. Bugs says, yes. And then Elmer's saying no, and Bugs is saying yes, and it's all flipped around. As soon as Roy said, OK, let's move in together, I thought, oh, I don't want that. And then I was saying, no, no, we should take our time and think about it. But he had outplayed me. You can rent out your townhouse and move in with me. He was ready to do it. And there I was with this ticking belly, but no pounding in my heart. It was my move. I said, I think we really should break up. He thought it was some kind of a game. He said, are you trying to protect me? Are you dying and don't want me to know? <laughs> no, I'm not. He said, where did this come from? Are you having a nervous breakdown? No, I'm not. I am sorry. Roy came by my place a few days later to drop off my stuff, and he asked if we could go for a walk. We were on the trail behind my house when he stopped and said, you win. He held out a diamond ring and said, I am in love with you. I am sorry I made you wait, but I am ready to spend the rest of my life with you. My heart stopped. This wasn't what I had wanted. I said, I, I can't marry you. I am not in love with you. He thought I was playing hard to get. He offered me a better proposal, a bigger ring. I had to convince him that I meant it. And when I did, he told me I was crazy. And he meant it. And then we really were broken up. He had thought all along that I had been playing him. And I realized I had been. I had been playing at making him love me. And I won. So why does it feel so much like losing? My name is Simon Muchohi. I grew up in a rural village in Kenya among a large family of 10 kids. We were very poor. I came to the US eight years ago as a student. And now I work with the city of Boston Public Health Commission. So when you arrived to the United States, what did you study and where did you study at? When I came to the US, I joined the Harvard School of Public Health and I got a master's of public health degree. Hmm. Yeah. And did you come from a family that had a storytelling tradition? Yes, 
my maternal grandmother used to tell me a lot of stories. And my father's brother was a terrific storyteller. <laughs> he died a few years ago at the age of 100. Wow. But he was not educated. He was illiterate, but uh, he would keep us laughing, telling us stories. Mm. And he was so good at that. I'm mm. not surprised he lived to be 100 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he was, he was the best. So what are you hoping that the audience takes away from your story this evening? I think the message is that uh, always do the right thing irrespective of, of the circumstances. I'm sitting at Harvard Yard in Cambridge. The day is warm and sunny. I'm very excited and I'm also feeling very proud because I'm attending my graduation ceremony. It is like a miracle for me. I grew up in a village in Kenya. We were very poor. I was the first person in the entire village to go to Harvard. <laughs> At Harvard, I gained some confidence. I think I became of a confident, but I was also very naive. I was so confident that I could get a job. I never bothered to start looking for one for the next four weeks after graduation. <laughs> Later, I applied for three jobs at Harvard. I was rejected three times. I was devastated, but the experience harbored me. Four months later, I still didn't have a job. I was running out of money and becoming desperate. I realized that I had graduated with a major in student loan debt and a minor in public health. <laughs> I went to see my Kenyan friend, David. I had met him when I was a student at, uh, at Harvard University. I told him about my major problem. He was very sympathetic. He said, Simon, in Kenya, you can borrow money from your friends. In the US, you swipe, use your credit card. <laughs> I had no money, I had no credit, forget about the credit card. He gave me $20. I ran across the street and went to the nearest grocery store. I picked uh, yesterday's bread for her price, a pack of chicken drumsticks, and a gallon of milk. As I was going to the checkout counter, I saw this big sign which said, we are hiring. I talked to the lady at the desk and said, okay, please hire me. She said, go online. I could not wait to check out before I started eating my yesterday's bread, which was so delicious. <laughs> that evening, I prepared a nice meal of drumsticks. I was very happy, but I was very ashamed. I was jobless, I was broke, and I was borrowing money to feed myself. I decided to count the money, and I was surprised. It did not make sense. I was very sure that I had less than $20 in my pocket. I counted the money and I had $89.50. I said, this is a miracle. <laughs> I have enough money to last me for the next four weeks. <laughs> I was so excited I could not even fall asleep. I woke up in the middle of the night and some demons were tormenting me. I thought I saw my mother standing by my bedside. She was looking at me with large, ugly eyes. She pointed at me and said, Simon, do you want to steal that money? My mother used to tell us, we are poor, but we are honest. The next day, I went back to the grocery store to return the money. I talked to the supervisor. I couldn't find the cashier, and I left with my money. Later in the afternoon, I went back. I found the store manager, and I said that I wanted to return the money. She 
asked me how much money I had. I had eight dollars. And she said, yes, that's the exact amount we've been looking for. She called the store manager who gave me a store uh, gift card worth $50. The store manager said, do you want a job? I said, of course. <laughs> she had three jobs, and I, I didn't want to be a, a cashier. I didn't want anything to do with excess change. <laughs> I was happy stacking popcorn on the shelves, and that's what I did. I decided to do the right thing because my mother said so. <laughs> and somehow it made a difference in my life at that point. Watch Stories from the Stage anytime, anywhere. Visit worldchannel.org for full episodes and digital extras. Join us on social media and share your story only on World Channel.